so good morning and welcome to Provincial Stroke Grounds. I'm Dorothy Burridge and I'm the Regional, Edu Regional Education Coordinator with the Central East Stroke Network. And today's presentation is entitled Ischemic Stroke in Young Adults, Diagnostic Challenges and the Uncertainties, presented by Dr. Kanjana Pereira. Uh, these rounds are being recorded and will be archived, and you will be able to access them through the link provided in a follow-up email. Please check that you're on mute, and we would ask that all microphones remain on mute during the presentation unless you are asking a question. Please remember that the views expressed today are those of the presenter and not of the Zoom platform. There will be some reflective questions included throughout the presentation and then some time at the end for question and answer period. So please type your questions into the chat during the session. Uh, there is an evaluation and we will ask you to complete the evaluation either using the link or QR code, or you will have received a form as part of the invitation and you can scan that back to me. There were also certificates of attendance attached in the email invitation please fill in and keep for your own future reference. The Provincial Stroke Grounds Committee did mitigate bias by ensuring that there was no industry involvement in the planning or education content presented today. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kanjana Sashi Pereira. She is an investigator in the Brain Health Research Program at PHRI. She is an associate professor in medicine of neurology at McMaster University and a stroke neurologist at Hamilton Health Sciences. Her main research focus is on secondary stroke prevention, cryptogenic stroke, and uncommon causes of stroke and the optimization of clinical care in this patient population. She has served as principal investigator and co-investigator for phase two and three clinical trials and is on the adjudication committees for international multi-center stroke and cardiovascular trials. She has won research awards and her work has been published in high impact medical journals. She is the lead investigator in Young ESIS longitudinal cohort study and the CADAS ICAD study. And her research has been funded by HHS, PHRI and CIHR. So welcome, Dr. Pereira. Thank you, Dorothy, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. And so thank you for the invitation to present at the provincial rounds. It's my pleasure to be here. I would, um, so this um, presentation, I would like it to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to ask any questions as I'm going. I would like it to be more clinically based. So I'm going to go over some cases to, um, get you thinking of how to investigate these young patients. Um, these are my disclosures. I'll give you a minute. Uh, there's nothing pertaining to this talk. Uh, and objectives for today, as mentioned, I want to go over, uh, the, I want to review the epidemiology risk factors and causes of stroke in young adults. I want to focus a little bit of, uh, on embolic stroke of undetermined source in young adults. How, how do we define this and what's the importance? What's the difference between young and old adults? And then uh, we'll have a discussion of case-based approach to investigating stroke in young adults. So stroke in young adults, uh, as we all know, um, we, uh, stroke is one of the leading causes of death and number one cause of disability worldwide. And in 2019, the Global Burden of Disease study showed that there was estimated 12.2 million incident stroke cases worldwide. And um, the, it is good news, though, that since to, uh, 1990 to 2019, the incidence of stroke has been reducing when we take all comers of stroke, but the incidence of young onset stroke has steadily increased since 1980s. So this is concerning because then because of this, the disability adjusted life years lost uh, in these young stroke patients are, um, are, are much larger than in older stroke patients. So how do we define a young patient? Um, it's in observational studies and registries, young patient is commonly defined as those younger than 50 years. However, this doesn't mean like if a 55 year old comes with no other vascular risk factors, should we apply the same theory for this uh, 50, uh, 55 year old? 
sure we should it, 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 it is um, something you have to use a little bit of um, uh, your experience when defining this younger population but for all the data we have it's less than 50 years old and uh, so uh, about 10 to 15 percent of first ever strokes occur in these young adults and as we have come to know, traditional risk factors are not very frequent. And because of that, we have to think of uncommon causes, like how do they play, in, play a part in these uh, strokes? So when you look at mortality and morbidity compared to older adults, uh, the one-year mortality in young adults is low, like it's 4.5 compared to 15 to 35% one-year mortality in older adults. And also the recurrence rate is lower in uh, young adults compared to older adults. This is all comers with ischemic stroke, not just one specific cause. And depending on the cause, this may vary a little bit. Um, so it's about 1.5 per year for young adults, uh, the stroke recurrence, and compared to 2 to 15%, depending on the cause for older adults. When we look at functional outcome, yes, like Compared to older adults, there's a significantly better uh, functional outcome in younger patients. However, you can see like only one third ha has a complete recovery. So MRS zero is only reached by one third of the patients and about two thirds, 60%, uh, close to two thirds of patients have mild to moderate impairment, uh, MRS one to three. And this is very concerning. Like the, these patients are the workforce and they have more of neurocognitive stuff that's going on, like not something that we can capture on um, NIHSS or any like physical disability, but they would have um, a lot of uh, other disabilities that prevent them from, from entering the workforce. Therefore, it's very important that we prevent uh, the first ever stroke or the recurrent strokes. So when we look at stroke etiology, according to age, you see uh, in patients more than 50 years of age, um, the one of the commonest causes is cardiac disease, like emb embolic stroke form cardiac causes that about makes about 30%, mainly atrial fibrillation, but also valvular heart disease and um, left ventricular thrombus is in this category. And then large artery atherosclerosis, either extracranial um, uh, carotid artery or intracranial large artery, large to medium artery atherosclerosis, make about 25% of strokes. And then lacunar strokes, like uh, small vessel disease uh, caused by arteriolar sclerosis, accounts for about 20% of strokes. And in this population, in the older population, unusual causes are uncommon. It only makes about 5% of the strokes. And then ESIS, we'll go over the definition of ESIS. This is a subset of patients that we um, previously called cryptogenic. And those patients make about 15% of stroke. And then undetermined is about 5%. These would be patients that wouldn't have had uh, the um, necessary um, investigations to call it uh, ACEs or they, those who would not have had, uh, would have some um, two or more um, competing uh, etiologies for the stroke. So when you look at patients less than 50 years, this completely um, is the opposite of, the etiologies become very opposite of what's uh, in the older adults. So ESIS actually make about 40% of strokes. Um, and then um, large artery disease, small vessel disease and atrial fibrillation only account for about 23%. And this is also mainly in the patients between uh, 40 to 50 years. And in these pa patients, rare causes are much more common and um, dissection is um, also included in, in the old adults in unusual causes, dissection would be included there. So if that's the case, like one in five would have a rare cause of stroke. And, and then other cardiac causes other than atrial fibrillation are much common in this younger population. And obviously about 8% re remain undetermined even after investigations. So you have to keep this in mind when you're investigating or thinking about a young stroke patient. So what is embolic stroke of undetermined source? Um, this is um, a new clinical construct in 2014 uh, uh, that was um, done by the ESIS and cryptogenic stroke working group. The, for uh, a stroke to be ESIS, it has to be non-lacunar. So if you do an MRI it, uh, in the 
uh, flare sequence, it has to be less than 1.5 centimeters and uh, subcortical. So if a subcortical tiny stroke, then um, that would not qualify as an ACEs. And they have to have um, open arteries, meaning there should not be significant stenosis more than 50% proximal to the infarct. So if that's, if there's more than 50% stenosis, that would go as a large artery sten large artery uh, etiology. And then uh, at, they should have at least an ECG and cardiac monitoring for at least 24 hours and um, minimum of a transthoracic echocardiogram. And there should be no major risk cardiac source um, uh, identified. So if these few um, investigations are done, then um, you you call a, it as ACEs uh, is a stroke. And then um, when you look at what type of strokes happen in ACEs, it can be any of these patterns can happen in ACEs. It could be fragmented infarction, like a tiny artery to, from what we, these tiny ones that could be from artery to artery embolism or a large territory infarction or posterior circulation infarction. And it could be simultaneous infarction in the subcortical areas too. So all this will qualify as ACEs strokes. So this was um, this was this concept was used in two large studies. I'm sure most of you has heard about these studies, navigate ACEs and respect ACEs, which included patients mostly about the age of 50 years to look whether um, the these patients would benefit better from um, anticoagulation compared to antiplatelet aspirin therapy. And we know that those trials were neutral and didn't show any benefit or of anticoagulation over anti um, antiplatelets. So treatment wise, yes, we have this entity, but we know that treatment wise, aspirin is as good as any other medication so far. And um, but what we found in older adults were that there, there was a higher risk of recurrence. It was about six percent per year in both these studies that included about fourteen thousand patients. So uh, we wanted to look at what what this. Um, is this reflective of younger adults too? Uh, how, how would the, uh, does this apply to young adults? And um, so this is the reason the Young ACEs Longitudinal Cohort Study was done. And uh, this was a study that was done um, in 13 countries, 41 centers was included, and there was 535 patients followed for average of 12 years. What we found was, um, like other ischemic stroke patient, uh, recurrence rates, there was a lower risk of recurrence in young adults, 1.9 per 100 patient years. And the factors that was associated with recurrence was history of coronary, uh, coronary artery disease, was the uh, coronary artery disease history of stroke or TIA and diabetes. Um, they did have a lower rate of AF. So we know these are not driven by covert atrial fibrillation. And this was say, uh, seen in the um, older adult groups to the navigators and respective studies, like there was less than 10% of people with atrial fibrillation. This population, however, had a high prevalence of PFO. 50% uh, of those who had a transthoracic echocardiogram with bubble study had a PFO. Not everyone had a bubble study. So this is only from, from those who had P, um, bubble studies that had 50%. Even though they had a um, high prevalence of PFO, this does not reflect as having an increased risk of recurrence. I'll go over it in a little bit like why this could be, uh, because we know the PFO associated stroke recurrence rates are very low, even on aspirin. So um, most recurrent strokes, again, was 64%, uh, one in um, two thirds were, e again, met the category criteria for ACEs even after investigations. So we, we kind of need to do better on this population. Um, so we'll go over like, is it, um, is it enough to call these patients ACEs? Should we investigate a little bit further knowing that uncommon causes are much commoner in the younger population? So I, um, it, are there any questions up to now? If not, I'll go over uh, some stroke etiologies in the young with case illustrations, and please feel free to ask questions as we go. So the first case, we have a 24-year-old male uh, with left-sided weakness and slurred speech, and um, his blood work, so basic blood works, that would mean CBC lights, blood, creatinine, and extended lights were normal. 
CTA, um, MRI, obviously, CT showed the right MCA stroke and uh, CTA was normal, no atherosclerosis, nothing, no dissection, nothing was identified. TTE was normal. And he went on to, because all this uh, were normal, the next step would be doing a T a transesophageal echocardiogram with bubble study. He did have a moderate size PFO with right to left shunt at rest and with valsalva. And hold for 24 hours um, showed no atrial fibrillation. So in this patient, um, uh, I want you all to think, is this enough information for you to go ahead and consider this as a PFO-related um, stroke, um, or, or do you need more information? Uh, how would you proceed with this patient? Um, so think, think about it, and we'll go over uh, how, how to decide on um, whether this PFO is uh, related to the stroke or not, or whether we need to go over further investigations. So PFO closure studies, there is a meta-analysis of all the PFO closure studies. Um, this is, um, there was 3,627 patients and the mean follow-up was 3.7 years. Um, the absolute benefit of PFO closure was small, in highly selected and young stroke patients. So not all comers, they were very highly selective, will go over the criteria. Uh, and stroke rate, even on antiplatelet therapy was about 1% per year. So it's not a very high stroke rate. Um, and there was a significant difference, statistically significant difference in ischemic stroke recurrence for, uh, on those who had PFO closure versus P, uh, no PFO closure, just on antiplatelet therapy, with the, um, with the number needed to treat uh, about 50 patients for 3.7 years to prevent one event. And uh, however, one thing to remember is these people with PFO closure did have an uh, increased development of atrial fibrillation. However, most of these were mostly transient um, and uh, some were uh, persistent. So that is something you have to uh, keep in mind. So how do we decide is if your patient is need PFO closure, is this the cause of the stroke? Um, few things you can do. Uh, the reason we have to really consider this just because we find a PFO, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, uh, it's causal. It could be just an innocent bystander because we know about 20 to 25% of the population has PFOs. Um, and so it could be incidental finding in stroke patients. What we have to decide is this other 20% who, uh, who has a PFO that's pathogenic. And um, so easy stroke or cryptogenic stroke plus PFO doesn't necessarily mean that that was causal. If it is a larger, larger PFO, if it is associated with atrial um, uh, septal aneurysm, and if there's um, right to left shunting in uh, at rest. Those are factors uh, that, uh, that, that would really help you decide whether th this PFO is causal versus non-causal. And in this, in our patient, uh, when you go over the history, he actually says he had flu-like symptoms and was really not moving around, was in his room, um, mostly in the bed for four or five days before this happened. And then he was actually on um, in the washroom straining and had this ha had these symptoms. So it, it, it can't get better than that for a uh, like the history can't get better than that for a paradoxical embolism. So in him, uh, there's no like, it's likely pathogenic. There is another score that you can use, the ROPE score. And um, so the higher the score, it's more likely that patient, um, patient stroke is likely to be attributable to PFO. So in his case, if you put the points, he scores like he's 824, so he has five points and then uh, one point each for all this because of how his stroke is no risk factors. So he scores 10 points and his likelihood of this PFO being related to um, related to the stroke is about 90%. Saying that the recurrence rate goes down because PFO associated strokes recurrence is about 1% per year or even on aspirin. So then it's a discussion whether the patient needs to be, um, uh, anti uh, patient needs to have closure or not. So few things I would do before um, patients are considered for PFO is so we know like there has to be some clot formation. So it's good to do uh, in this case, 
it's good to do um, uh, hypercoagulable screen. I would not advise on doing hypercoagulable screen in all comers, but if they, you find a right to left shunt, and then that's one instance you would do hypercoagulable screen, mainly because then your management changes, you put them on anticoagulation, and then uh, the PFO closure might not be that effective if the patient is on anticoagulation. All right. Any questions on that case? Okay, we'll move on to the second case. Have a 38 year old school teacher with sudden onset speech difficulties and right sided weakness. And her blood work, basic blood work, not, not everything like as I mentioned before, CBC lights, bunk creatine, external lights are normal. CT, CT, CT shows um, this left MCA stroke and CTA was very clean, no athero. Holter, 24 hours, no atrial fibrillation. Echocardiogram with bubble studies, no cardiac source of embolism identified. So are we happy calling this patient a possible ESIS because he's, she's had all the investigations that's needed for ESIS or do we really need to do um, further investigations? Thoughts on that? So, um, in this in this scenario, the in a patient, young patient with no risk factors, it, it's always good to not stop at just a transthoracic echocardiogram. You have to do a transesophageal echocardiogram. It's almost um, not in older patients, but in younger patients, it's almost a must-have test. So she went on to have a um, echocard transthoracic uh, transesophageal echocardiogram. And then um, there, it was reported saying that there was no cardiac source of embolism um, in the interpretation. However, in the body of the uh, echocardiogram, it says um, on bubble testing, there was late appearance of bubbles in the left atrium. So what does this mean? Is this a PFO or is this something else? So late appearance of bubbles is uh, an indication that maybe um, it's, it's coming from the lungs. There's paradoxical embolism, uh, like right to left shunt, but not probably from the, um, from, um, the heart itself. So uh, we went on to do a CT angiogram on this patient uh, of the chest, and she actually had a, um, a uh, AVM of the lungs, uh, atriovenous malformation, and she also had a few clots in that AVM. So to, when, when uh, we asked about the history, actually, in her history, she's, um, she just came back from a March break, uh, had a like a six hour flight um, for, for my, um, when she came back and about two, three days later, she developed the symptoms. So she probably got a DVT. Uh, it went to the lungs. Uh, not, she didn't have a PFO. And because there was a right, AVM right to left shunt in there, she had a uh, right to left shunt and had a stroke. So these patients, um, so pulmonary AVMs are not common. Um, they, they can occur sporadically. And 70, mostly like 70% uh, is associated with her hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. And if that's the case, you would know that beforehand. Before they have a stroke, they'll have all these other symptoms. They will have telangiectasia in the mouth, um, nose, uh, and everywhere. And they will have, they usually present at an early age with nose bleeds. And they can have pulmonary AVM, cerebral, and hepatic AVMs. It's autosomal dominant disease. So I, I think the patients we see, like when they come, they wouldn't have this diagnosis, but they would be more sporadic pulmonary AVM patients. So incidence is not very high. It's about two to three cases per 100,000. However, risk of stroke secondary to PVMs are, can be as high as 2.6 to 25%. So it's very important to make sure like you have that in the back of your mind when you're investigating a young stroke patients. So um, uh, diagnosis like can, you can suspect it when you do echo with bubble study and they comment on late appearance of bubbles, but uh, CTA or MRA chest can be used. However, it's not very, very sensitive. If you have a very high suspicion, um, you, you, uh, you go ahead with doing a, um, a conventional angiogram. And uh, treatment is, um, sometimes it's medical management, antiplatelets versus anticoagulant. If you do find a clot, like you put anticoagulant therapy, 
If the uh, AVMs are more than three millimeters, usually they do go for embolization. And if they have other, other, um, other features of like pulmonary hypertension, that's another indication for embolization. Okay, that's uh, case two. Any questions so far? Okay. So we'll go to case three. We have a 18 year old African-American male with sudden onset left-sided weakness and speech difficulties. No significant past medical history, no birth history is okay, development is okay, no trauma or substance use, and basic blood work is normal. CT scan shows this, uh, right MCA stroke, and he went on to have a CTA. CTA shows this. So what do people think this is? It's it's uh, the, from the looks of it, it's not like just a carotid stenosis or a plaque, it's a carotid web. There's increasing evidence now that uh, the carotid webs are associated with increased risk of stroke because you can imagine this is just like a flap um, waving around in the blood vessel and there can be clot form, clots that form around it. So this is thought to happen because of fibromuscular dysplasia and not the usual fibromuscular dysplasia we see, but the intimal hyperplasia type. And that would cause some um, in, intimal uh, changes that could cause a flap. Um, so uh, just to, in, in this patient, yes, the patient needs to have a halter and an echo for completion sake, but after those, we have we are pretty confident this is some, not something we can just ignore, like this could be the stroke uh, cause of a stroke. So carotid webs are rare, uh, accounts for about 1% of ischemic strokes in young adults. And it is commoner in um, young, uh, fe young females and those of black race. And doesn't really mean like males can get it too. And the few patients I've seen have actually been all male patients. Um, and it does have a 30% recurrent stroke risk in two years. So it, it, it is not uh, something we can miss. Uh, it, this is uh, why it's very important in a young adult. You have to do a CT angiogram rather than uh, ultrasound scan. Yes, ultrasound scans are good um, to assess the um, um, assess the carotid artery, but I would recommend doing a CT angiogram in all young patients just because you can assess from attic arch to the uh, vertex and you, you do get clues about the etiology by doing a CT angiogram than a car uh, carotid ultrasound. And so managing these carotid webs, it's mainly antiplatelet therapy. You do not anticoagulate them. And uh, if it's causing significant stenosis uh, or if it is causing recurrent strokes, the so if you go to surgical options like carotid stent stenting or endarterectomy. Okay. Let's move to case four. Um, we have a 45 year old female with left-sided weakness and speech difficulties, no past medic significant past medical history, although she's developed some shortness of breath recently and initial basic blood work is normal. Uh, her echo actually shows hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is um, not, not known. And she this is her um, MRI showing a right pontine stroke, um, a small, uh, less than two centimeter stroke. And then um, the, basal, um, the basal artery, the posterior circulation actually looks a little bigger than, uh, so it, it, the artery is dolichoactetic. So if the basal artery is four, more than 4.5 uh, millimeters a, uh, in diameter, then it's called a dolichoactetic basal artery, which would mean like normal than it's enlarged than it usually should be. Um, and there is a little bit of calcification. Um, however, uh, no other calcification anywhere else. So in her, are you, um, uh, what do you think the cause of stroke? I, I do not have um, the polling, uh, but I would like you to think for yourselves, like um, this is a subcortical stroke. Are you happy call, uh, telling that this is a small vessel disease and leave it there? Could it be an intracranial atherosclerotic disease because it can cause a small stroke from barge artery disease, which could look um, uh, similar to that. 
do you call it ACEs type of stroke or she has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Uh, could it be a cardioembolic stroke? Um, or would you want more information given how this history has evolved? Because we do not know uh, what caused the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She doesn't really have um, hypertension as far as we know. Um, and um, why, why would she have a dolichoactetic artery? So the enlargement of these arteries are not uncommon in older patients who had hypertension for a long time, who, um, who had vascular risk factors for a long time. But in a younger patient, this is a little unusual. So, um, if you if you're someone who think that I that you would want more information, when you do a general examination on her, this is what you find. Um, she has some angiokeratomas in the buttock areas and um, and in her lower thighs, uh, upper thighs. So, um, anyone want to take a guess at what this could mean? Uh, what diagnosis you should pursue? So what's the significance of this? Um, so Fabry disease is something in a young patient we can't really miss. It is an X-linked disease, so it's more commonly seen in males. However, um, female carriers have had variety of symptoms. They can present with stroke as their first, um, first, uh, first presentation of the Fabry disease. So when they have full-blown disease, especially males that some, and some females, they, they start with like acroparesthesia, burning sensation of feet and hand, and they would have about 90% would have angiokeratoma, mainly in the um, uh, buttocks and upper thigh areas. And, um, <clears throat> and, and these patients at this develop because of glycogen storage disorder, because of uh, deficiency of uh, lysosomal enzyme alpha galactosidase A. The importance of diagnosis this is there's a treatment. So um, you can treat it with synthetic alpha gal A, or there's some chaperone um, uh, oral treatment too. So this uh, they do have to have treat because it's a genetic mutation. They have to have treatment every three to four weeks uh, IV infusion. However, it's river like they can live a normal life um, for a normal life with life expectancy of 60 to 70 years if you do diagnose this. Otherwise, they would go on to, especially female carriers, they can go on to have strokes. They can have strokes because of cardiac involvement. They can have cardioembolic strokes. And if they have um, strokes because of um, the stroke, like the lysosomal glycogen storage in the um, blood vessels um, that can cause small vessel disease type of stroke or large artery type of strokes. So why they have dolichoactasia enlargement of the arteries is because of the glycogen storage in the endothelial cells. Those arteries just become a little uh, fragile um, and then they expand. Uh, and uh, untreated, they, this could um, get very, um, like untreated, they could have recurrent strokes, uh, recurrent MIs, and it's not a good outcome. So for Fabry disease, I, it's, it's very important that you do a general examination, a thorough general e examination in young patients. And um, you would send, I usually, if I can't find a cause, even if they don't have, uh, it, most patients have one or two angiokeratomas in, um, and I, I do send for Fabry disease testing because it's something that's treatable. Um, so that's something you have to consider. <clears throat> So two more cases, and then we'll open up for discussion. Um, so we have a 28-year-old female presents with visual disturbance in the right visual field. She was actually playing soccer, um, was hit with the soccer ball on the head and had developed some headache and visual field disturbance. Um, and um, so she, her past medical history, uh, she's had two miscarriages. Uh, in uh, both were in first trimester. She's on oral contracep contraceptive pills for three years. Her basic blood work was normal. However, she, because she had this rash, she on general examination, she had this rash. So 
because of that, she went on to have a uh, vasculitic strain because this looks like a levator reticularis or levator esmosa, and uh, that would indicate maybe she has some vasculitic process. So she went on to have uh, all the vasculitis screen plus anticardiolipine and lupus anticoagulant and beta-2 glycoprotein. She did have a positive anticardiolipine IgM and lupus anticoagulant, uh, very high teeters. Um, and then uh, she also went on to have the other investigations, the TTE and TE with bubble study and Holter, those were normal. Um, so how do you want to proceed with this patient? So the questions that we have when we find this um, abnormal blood work is, is this finding a cause of the stroke? Does it explain her symptoms? Does she recur for the investigations or what should be done about it? So how do we decide whether this finding is true? So antiphospholipid syndrome, the diagnostic criteria is very specific. However, it's only 74% sensitive. Um, so you have to have one from each box to call it antiphospholipid uh, syndrome. You have to have a vascular thrombosis either in the arterial venous or small vessel like capillary blood um, vessels and or a pregnancy morbidity. It has to be more than three consecutive spontaneous abortions less than 10 weeks of gestation or it could be more than one unexplained death of morphologically normal fetus more than 10 weeks or a premature birth less than three, uh, 34 weeks. The laboratory criteria is very strict too. Um, and it has to happen two or more week occasions, 12 weeks apart, and it can't be more than five years apart. Then you have to have like two or more again, like like say you have one in 2000 and then you have one positivity in 2008 that doesn't really qualify uh, that has to like he has she has to the patient has to have it uh, close by so it has to uh, she has to uh, the patient has to have lupus anticoagulant um, present and anticardiolipine IgG and O IgM uh, medium or high taters just a uh, small um, Low titers wouldn't really qualify, and anti beta 2 glycoprotein protein also more than 99 percentile. So, what's the reason for such a strict criteria? Like, why do we need that? It's because it's a commonly found antibody uh, in, in many situations. Uh, it could be present transiently with acute and chronic infections. Up to 30 percent of children uh, after viral infection could have these antibodies. And uh, children and adults, both with any infection with mycobacteria, syphilis, malaria, Q fever, other viruses can have transit elevations. So that's why the strict criteria. And also some medications that we use can cause increase in um, increase in the antiphospholipid antibody, especially one, one that would be used by uh, young females or, or a contraceptive pill would be one of them. And um, ACL can, and also can occur with other autoimmune diseases such as SLE or Sneddon syndrome. So you have to be careful, like you have to know what, uh, when you order it, you have to know how you would interpret it. And in patients with um, young stroke, about 20 to 25% would have this antibody, usually at low titers and transient. So this is the importance of repeating it. Um, and prevalence in healthy adults, in young individuals, it's about one to 7% would have like low titer prevalence, wouldn't really mean it's the cause of the, the thrombosis. And about 12 to 50% in older adults, the, the, that could be present. So you have to be really careful about interpreting it. And some blood donors have persistent levels uh, of uh, about 1% would have persistent levels of these antibodies. So um, what's the mechanism of stroke in antiphospholipid antibody? It's thrombotic or embolic. Very rarely it could cause vasculitis, although CNS vasculitis, in all honesty, is very, very rare. I've never seen one co uh, va causing vasculitis from APS, but it's a theoretical possibility. It can be associated with Moya Moya syndrome. And the presence of uh, lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipine antibody actually increase uh, ischemic stroke, first ischemic stroke by twofold, and the presence of just beta-2 glycoprotein has a twofold increase in MI. Um, each additional APL positivity, say you have one, uh, one positive, and then if there's another one positive, would uh, be associated with 50 to 70% increase in odds of arterial and venous thrombosis. 
So secondary prevention of stroke in APS, there's really no do, uh, trials directed at this population. However, the consensus hematology and rheumatology guidelines suggest uh, vitamin K antibodies, uh, meaning warfarin, and uh, rate of recurrence is highest if they have all three antibodies positive, about 30% recurrence over six years. And uh, you should not be treating these patients with DOAX. We have the TRAP study that showed that uh, rivaroxaban compared to uh, warfarin causes more events. Um, and uh, so we should not be using any DOAC in these patients. Okay, last case and uh, yeah. And then uh, we have a 26 year old female with uh, developed blurred vision and headache. Uh, and the next day she develops confusion, bumping into things on the right side, mild naming difficulties. Uh, she had developed uh, hearing loss at 21 years, no past medical history that's contributory otherwise. Family history is not contributory. No one is diagnosed with any genetic condition. Her, uh, matter, uh, her mom is still living, dad is living. They, uh, she's 5'1". She's uh, her mom is 5'1 in height and her dad and brother are 6'1". Maternal grandfather mother is still living. She, oh, this is a CT which shows some calcification in the uh, uh, basal ganglia and pulvina. And then her MRI shows um, DWI changes. However, there's not that much ADC changes. Um, her echocardiogram shows hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and blood work uh, is normal, uh, normal lactic acid and HbA1c is 7.7, .7, which she didn't know. Um, so in her case, what do you think is happening? Uh, because of hearing loss too, um, I would like you to think for yourselves, like, what, do you need more information or do you have a, a clue to what this could be? Um, so her, her, um, I'll go here. Her MRI shows that there's, um, her stroke is not really respecting arterial um, um, anatomical uh, area. It crosses borders, like it's uh, including occipital and uh, uh, temporal lobes. Uh, uh, so that, and then she has calcification because um, she's young, like in, in eight year old, we wouldn't really care about seeing this that much, but 26 year old shouldn't have it. She has hearing loss. So this could be some mitochondrial and um, mitochondrial disease. She went on to have MR spectroscopy and this showed um, a lactate peak uh, in the area of stroke, which is can be commonly seen because the cell, cells are dying there. So the lactate would be high, but the most important thing is you have to do a, um, on the normal brain and in the ventricles, she still have a lactate peak. That shouldn't be the case. So this is a mitochondrial disease and which is a multi-organ involvement disease. It's a maternal transmission because of that males and females are equally affected and they would have stroke-like episodes occurring before the age of 40, encephalopathy, seizures, and dementia. They usually have lactic acidosis even though our patient didn't have and um, they can have recurrent headaches, migraines, headaches, and recurrent vomiting. Um, so treatment wise, there's no good treatment. You go with co um, like preventatively, you treat them with coenzyme Q10 uh, and, or analogs to coenzyme Q10 and L-arginine IV doses can be used to treat uh, um, in acute situation and also riboflavin for prevent preventive uh, treatment. Okay. So I just, um, after these cases, I just want to go over how should you think about when you see a young patient, how do you think about workup? So uh, first of all, any young patient, CT or MRI brain, I would really uh, encourage you all to have MRI brain if possible, because that might give clues to some other diagnosis. In a young patient, if it is an embolic stroke, no other causes, you shouldn't see other findings, like you shouldn't see flare hyper intensities, a periventricular flare hyper intensities or anything like that. So I really recommend doing an MRI brain and then a CTA or MRA arch to vertex um, rather than uh, ultrasound scan. You can see in ultrasound scan, you can only see this area. So you might miss other diagnosis. Um, diagnosis like dissection, uh, here you see um, uh, the uh, flame-like uh, appearance that would 
uh, snatch the diagnosis of dissection and um, fibromuscular dysplasia, um, that, that could be the cause of the stroke. And intracranially, you see like things like RCVS, reversible vasoconstructive disorder, uh, can be seen, or vasculitis, and um, things like moya moya can be seen. So ideally, do an MRI and a CTA brain or MRA brain. And then you go ahead and do a very good history and general examination. General examination is something we forget to do, but very important, especially in all comers, but especially in young patients. And you do your routine blood work, don't add everything at the first go. I, for the routine blood work, I usually add antiphospholipid antibodies because again, the treatment differs. Uh, if you find antiphospholipid, if you, if the, you diagnose these patients with antiphospholipid antibody disorder, you have to do it less than 24 hours, um, uh, like as they come, because it, afterwards, because of the transient uh, increase um, associated with stroke, the lupus anticoagulant can be positive. And if they're on anticoagulation, like even um, low molecular weight heparin, it's a possibility that lupus, uh, they can be falsely positive or even negative. So you have to uh, make sure they're not um, on those. And then I would definitely, even if they denied toxic, uh, like substance abuse, add a toxin screen that would sometimes give you some clues. The additional blood work is very low yield. Unless specifically indicated, do not do additional blood work. Uh, thrombophilia screening, I've seen it being done, but it, unless they have a right to left shunt, there's no way that thrombophilia screening only causes venous embolism. So there's no way they would cause arterial embolism. So do not add thrombophilia uh, thrombophilia screening and also inflammation like uh, vasculitic screening, unless there's something to point you to us that don't do it and even infection. An EKG TTE with bubble study, and uh, I would always do a T transesophageal echocardiogram over a ca over prolonged cardiac monitoring in this population. So after you've done this, you've ruled out many causes like large artery diseases, cardioembolism, dissection, carotid web, RCVS, or large to medium vessel vasculitis, and antiphospholipid antibody. Um, the small vessel vasculitis you would not be able to see in a, a CT angiogram. So afterwards, you do you look for markers of unusual cause, and if they are there, you do a target investigation. Otherwise, you can call it embolic stroke of undetermined source. So these are a few things that you could go over, race and ethnicity, like if there's black race, you think of sickle cell disease, habitus, short, um, mitochondrial, tall uh, muffins, if they have scoliosis, uh, a genetic condition carousel, and past medical history you take into consideration, their presentation, constitutional symptoms, and family history would uh, point you towards Fabry Mila's or other genetic conditions. Physical examination, again, is very, very important. And imaging actually would, this is why um, uh, MRI would be better. Some of the small vessel uh, strokes um, can be due to these um, uh, genetic conditions, uh, which, which would uh, show you, I'll just show a few pictures. So in the, those people should have periventricular wide matter changes more than uh, uh, in addition to their stroke. So that would, uh, if a 40 year old, 30 year old present with a, a MRI like this, um, they should, um, this should clue you into like, there's something genetic going on. This just can't be just a stroke itself. This is just carousel. They would have scoliosis and for, uh, bold, a premature balding. So those are clues that would give, um, give rise, make you think that uh, this is more than, um, more than uh, just purely an embolic stroke. So take on four points, uh, stroke in young adults are not uncommon and are rising in incidence. Recurrence risk is uh, low. However, loss of disability adjusted life years is major. So you have to be uh, very thorough in investigating these patients. And uncommon causes of stroke are common in this young population and investigating objectively will help in the etiological diagnosis. Okay. Thanks a lot for listening. I'll take any questions and I do want to remind you to do the eval. It would really help with planning future programs and it would also help the speakers uh, um, to understand the participant learning needs. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. Um, again, I would really encourage uh, everyone if you've got questions to type them into the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask.
Um, we'd love to hear your questions. Kimberly. Yeah, I'm just wondering about um, patients with MELAS. I'm a family doctor and I have two sisters uh, with uh, MELAS and um, they've been to uh, genetics. Um, mm -hmm. And the only recommendation was for uh, uh, periodic um, audiology and um, ECG. So it, is there, is there, I'm wondering if there's new evidence, perhaps I should send them back for a repeat consultation. You were mentioning riboflavin, riboflavin CoQ10. Are these routine in the MELAS population now? Um, again, there's no good evidence for that. Uh, we do use them sometimes, uh, especially CoQ10, co um, and that would be um, that. That's one thing they can use, like even without going to um, going back to the genetic clinic. Like sometimes, like some of my patients just grab it, like take it from. Um, Costco or somewhere and use it. Uh, it's uh, again, as you said, like there's the idea is okay. This this would um, with the mitochondria failure, there's thought to be less nitric oxide development and therefore less um, versatility of the vessels. So that's the reason um, people think that coenzyme Q10, which help develop nitric oxide, may help. There's no good evidence, no randomized trials, but something to use. But most importantly, like they should be avoiding like statin, like statins, those type of things. There's few medications that could be um, that could uh, increase the um, risk of them having a mitochondrial uh, crisis. So th that that's the more important thing. It's not a bad idea. Like so, our genetic clinic um, does follow these patients, and they mostly. Uh, do recommend the coenzyme Q10 and riboflavin and alginine if they have acute acute event. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions, comments for Dr. Pereira? Yes, Ravi. Yeah, it's just a comment uh, because mitochondrial uh, uh, cytopathies uh, is not something, you know, uh, as an adult neurologist, we commonly see. Uh, but it's important uh, to avoid, in addition to considering these natrocyticals, uh, it's important to avo avoid the toxins. And one of the things is that these patients can commonly have seizures and a lot of patients are prescribed valproate. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to uh, avoid valproate in these population at all costs to control their epilepsy because that is one potential toxin which, which can tip the balance and, uh, and they can uh, present with the severe encephalopathy and can die. And uh, so again, because we are not very used to this, but uh, now a lot of population, they outgrow and, and, and uh, are adults. So it's important to avoid any, any mitochondrial toxin, particularly the anticonvulsants. Just a comment. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, there are a few other uh, medications that we even anti um, biotics that we use can cause like a crisis in this patient. So we have to, that's why the importance of them probably having a follow up at least two to three years. Most of the time they don't do anything, but having a follow up would be helpful. Yeah, another co um, question for you uh, is if somebody has a very small PFO, uh, mm -hmm. and otherwise is uh, cryptogenic. A mm -hmm. uh, patient had extended the uh, Holter monitor. Uh, the CTA is negative. There is, there's nothing intracranial small vessel. It looks like embolic stroke. Would you go for uh, still closure for this uh, very small, uh, sometimes mentioned as tiny PFO, even on TEE? Or uh, uh, what, what's your take on that? So I usually don't go for, uh, I do have a, we have a, um, uh, like interventional cardiology, uh, we, we, we do have discussion on every case. Uh, I usually don't go for closure. I do discuss with the patient a lot and give them the evidence. Most of the time, the patient uh, make the decision themselves, like they don't want to go. And I, I, I tell them like, I, Yes, it's there. It's most likely innocent bystander. And we don't have good evidence causing this. And it's not without risk because if they develop atrial fibrillation, that's 
kind of iatrogenic too. So um, I, in a very small PFOs, I don't go for um, closure. I do look for other like hypercoagulable screen in them and I would do more monitoring in them for cardiac monitoring just to make sure we are not missing um, anything else. And just a last question before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, about the carotid webs, what's the preference uh, locally uh, at your center in terms of going for early surgery, or do you wait for recurrence to uh, really pursue any any of the um, uh, revask options like endarterectomy or web resection versus the stent? Again, no evidence. We we do wait at least like six months to see how it's going. Sometimes what we see is um, after antiplatelet therapy, it's like stable. It looks like it doesn't look too like dangerous, like not flapping around. Then um, we just like, we do follow up with the ultrasound scan or a CTA in these patients. Again, it's very rare, right? I've only had three patients. So um, uh, following up these patients is, is the most important thing because they are young patients. Most of them can get lost to follow up and we don't know what happened to them. They might have had a recurrent stroke. So, um, uh, at first go, unless it's a huge one, I've we've never sent one for um, surgery or intervention at the first go. How about you, you all? Like, what do you guys do? Yeah, it, it might be just a just a preference that uh, uh, most of the patients, or or maybe even the uh, the population that uh, some of the patients either are asymptomatic, which I see, or patients who are coming with recurrent stroke, where during the first stroke, uh, the carotid web was not uh, identified. So in, in retrospect, mm -hmm. you know, we have a benefit that there's already recurrence yeah. while being on uh, medical therapy. So of course, you know, there's a bias towards uh, 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 doing intervention. And, and we do have some short-term and intermediate term uh, good data. I won't say good data, but uh, uh, reasonable data uh, in terms of the durability of the procedure that despite this being a fibromuscular dysplasia, there doesn't seem to be an early recurrence. Uh, when they are stented or they undergo um, uh, endarterectomy. So, and, and moreover, whatever the data we have available, the, the risk of recurrence uh, in that hemisphere is, is uh, basically uh, close to zero. So, so my preference is generally to offer intervention, especially if they are coming with a recurrence, but of course the, the first stroke with a very small web or patient who are asymptomatic web identified on CTA, uh, uh, with preferences to go medical. Yeah, exactly what we do, yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining this morning. Thank you, Dr. Pereira, for presenting. Uh, again, just a reminder, uh, if you can complete the evaluation, that would be most appreciated. The link is in the chat, and you will receive it again in your follow-up email. And just to let you know that uh, the next Provincial Stroke Rounds will be on June 1st, and the topic is Return to Work income and access to social services and resources for low income stroke survivors. So thank you again for joining this morning and wish everyone a great day. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pereira.